Good afternoon, everyone. This is Marcus James, Manager, Office of Administrative Services here at ACA, along with Heidi McAuliffe, Vice President, Government Affairs, also here at ACA. And we welcome you to this edition of the ACA Member Webinar Series. Today's topic, Getting Out of the Lab, Advantages of Evaluating Coatings in a Real-World Manufacturing Environment. A couple of administrative notes before we get into the presentation. Attendees are in listen-only mode, so if you would please enter your questions in the questions dialog box, and we'll have a Q&A at the end where those questions will be answered. I'll read those off for our speaker, and the speaker will answer those. There's also a brief survey at the end. It's one question. It'll take you 10 seconds flat to answer it, and we would appreciate your feedback on that. Also, um, as we advance the slides, you may notice a, a, a lag in your local view. Um, that'll be depending on your bandwidth, but if we have an issue on this end, we'll let you know. And with that, I am going to turn this over to Heidi to tell us a little bit about today's presenter. Thanks, Marcus. And, uh, and <clears throat> let me extend my welcome as well, not only to our attendees, but uh, to you, Dr. Corrigan. So it's my pleasure to introduce Doug Corrigan. He is the director of ChemQuest Technology Institute a state-of-the-art research and development facility that focuses its resources on supporting the entire specialty chemicals value chain from synthesis to formulation to application. Doug spent his career as a research scientist, entrepreneur, and a program manager. In his educational career, he's collected a BS and a Master of Science degree in engineering physics and material science. And he also holds a PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology. So Doug, welcome. We're eager to hear your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me today and greetings to everyone who's listening in. And hopefully um, if, so, if people are, aren't on the call, they can listen to the presentation later and the recording and everything goes well with the technology, uh, with the, with the, um, bandwidth. So hopefully things will go well. Uh, my name is Doug Corrigan. I'm the director of the ChemQuest Technology Institute. Today I'm going to be discussing uh, some of the issues that formulators and raw material suppliers may want to look into with respect to um, using your materials to you know, test them in a real manufacturing environment before uh, launching them or bringing them to market and some of the advantages of that and some of the issues you might want to take a look at and the advantages of that. So most of us are, are familiar with, you know, lab scale testing of coatings where you do, for example, drawdowns of, of paint onto small test coupons um, and then do battery of ASTM tests on those coupons applied with a very defined method, you know, like a drawdown bar or a small cup gun. Uh, to produce like a three by six sample of the coating. And that's where most of the testing is done. But the question I want to pose to you today is what else can be learned about your coating or your or your raw material that goes into a coating or other type of product? What can you learn from actually going the next step and testing those materials in an actual pilot scale manufacturing environment that replicates either directly or indirectly uh, what's occurring at the, the factory level. What else can you learn about your formulation? What adjustments can you make to your formulation to help improve performance that your customer end user of the coding is going to experience when they use it? And so there's lots of issues to, to look at here, but let's dive in. So First, I want to ask her, what, what are the benefits of testing your material in a simulated manufacturing environment uh, going above the lab? What is What are some of the advantages that you can experience? So one is, um, first off, is you can catch problems before they become a problem to your customer. So basically, you want to fail before your customer does. So if there's some lurking issue that you that's unidentified and unpredictable that you don't know uh, you don't want your experience you don't want your customer to find that out before you do you want to find that out and the other issue is 
if there is a problem experienced in the factory with the application or performance of the coating, the question is immediately going to be, is this a factory problem, or the application, or is this a chemistry problem? Uh, is it a problem with the actual design of the formula, or is it something going wrong with the application of it? In any event, you want to solve the problem for the customer, so they want to continue using your product. Um, and so being able to go to the manufacturing scale before you launch a product, you can answer these questions before uh, and have a uh, sort of a toolkit to help your customers debug issues as they arise because you're already aware of them. Um, the other issue is you can actually optimize your formula or your raw material to be um, better applied in the factory level under a larger range of conditions. So, you know, your coating is going to experience a large range of humidities, temperatures, substrates, geometries of parts, um, cleanliness of substrates uh, in the factory level, handling, temperature issues, all of those variables. And the question is, can you design your formula such that it's optimized to, to work under a very large range of environmental um, and circumstantial uh, conditions in the factory that you may not have tested at the lab scale with just a simple drawdown or a test coupon that was prepared in the lab. So you can use that data that you're generating to iteratively design your formula, change your formula so that it operates under a wider range of conditions. And this is going to play into the adhesion of the coating on different substrates and parts, as well as the film formation, the aesthetics of the coating itself. Um, and so you can use that data to help design your coding from the start rather than doing it after the fact and having to change your formula after it's already been launched uh, to, to the market. And then also the third point would be the benefit would be if you have this type of data, it would set you apart from uh, the normal course of business. The normal course of business is to provide uh, customers with you know, a tech data sheet with a very limited set of ASTM tests that are done on the coding, uh, but they actually have a data package that shows it was applied on this type of factory line uh, with this type of spray equipment and pumps and onto these types of geometries of parts and substrates goes above and beyond what the normal um, raw material supplier formulator offers their customers and it would give you an advantage in the market to have that information. So, uh, can you guys still see my screen? Hey, Doug. Yeah, it's Marcus. I was just about to say, if you're advancing slides, I'm not seeing that. Okay. Okay, what slide can you see? see All right. That? Yep, the big big red arrow in the middle, pointing to the Did right. Did you see, was this yep. slide showed before? No, I'm seeing that for the first time now. Okay, can, so can you slides back, right? yeah, can you click back and forth once just to make sure that it's okay, there you go. Okay, so this is the first slide I showed where you know normally you're doing a coding on a small scale like this, but what can you learn from going to a larger uh, in a real world manufacturing environment? So that's the question I'm posing. Um, and these are the benefits of testing in a simulated manufacturing environment, catch on foreseen problems, optimize your formula, and then have an advantage with your customers. Okay, so the factors that most people don't consider um, in their raw material design or their formulation design at lab scale, um, first off is, you know, what are the failure modes for your coding? Uh, normally, these most failure modes won't be exposed at the lab scale uh, with the normal battery of ASTM tests. It'll get you so far in terms of basic parameters of like adhesion or gloss level, um, but it's not going to really fully expose what the failure modes are because most failure modes occur uh, as a convergence of different stresses occurring at the same time. It could be a geometry with environment 
um, it could be, um, you know, the type of uh, substrate along with the cleanliness of the substrate along with the airflow. So there's a convergence of different variables that aren't necessarily accounted for at the lab scale uh, that won't expose failure modes of your coding. And when I say failure modes, I'm referring to failure in the application of the coding to, to produce a good quality fill. Um, so going to the factory level and pu putting your coding on actual parts will expose those failure modes before your customers do. Um, the other components normally not considered is the part geometry. Most, most times when you're doing tests in the lab, um, you're doing it on small little flat, perfectly flat, three by six ASTM, you know, Q panels or whatever. And you're doing a either a spray onto those panels uh, with a small cup gun, or you're doing a drawdown with a drawdown bar. Uh, so what happens when you actually apply the coating to something with a um, complex three-dimensional shape that has edges, uh, internal and external edges, convex and concave surfaces, uh, vertical surfaces, horizontal surfaces, um, and all of this, uh, the part geometry will play into not, not only the shape of the component, but the mass of it. So the heat mass is going to dictate how uh, the heat flow dynamics, which will dictate how fast the solvent evaporates from your coating. And then those dynamics control the film quality in terms of uh, film surface, um, and, and the quality of that. So you can experience pinholes and craters and orange peel simply by uh, not something you could have ever measured by a flat panel in your in your lab, but if, once you go to a three-dimensional shape uh, that has a mass to it, uh, these issues start to arise that you, did, you weren't aware of. So the part geometry plays a role. And then uh, third is the environment, which is you know your temperature in your factory, the relative humidity in the factory, or in the field, um, and then the condition of the substrate. So in a factory, obviously, things aren't perfectly clean. When you're in a lab environment making test coupons, the first thing technicians do is they clean the substrates perfectly clean with a solvent like MEK, and you, you have a perfectly flat, perfectly prepared, perfectly clean substrate, and all of the data is generated from that. In the factory, that's not how things are. In the field, that's not how things are. And oil and dust and rust and all of these other things can really uh, play havoc with the film quality. Being able to have that data, understand it, and design your formula such that it's resistant to those types of other environmental effects would would give you know a formulator or a raw material supplier an advantage. Uh, another factor to consider is pretreatments. Um, Different manufacturers use different pretreatment methods and protocols. They don't necessarily use the pretreatment method you want them to use. They use the ones that they're, they're set up to use in their factory, uh, whether it be baths that they clean the parts in uh, or some type of plasma pretreatment or flame treatment, uh, corona treatment or a conversion coating that might go on like zinc phosphate. So everyone's gonna use their own pretreatment protocols, and the question would be, have you tested your coding using the various pretreatment methods that customers would also use in their environment? The fourth would be application equipment. Um, I've, I've divided this up into two different categories. You have pumps and delivery systems. There's lots of different types of ways of pumping material to the spray apparatus. Uh, from pneumatic pumps to gear pumps to pressure pots, et cetera. Um, and these can be low pressure, high pressure um, systems, depending on the rheology and viscosity of your material. But there are chemistries that become shear sensitive, and I'll share an example of that with you later. Um, and, and so delivery of your coating, how does it get to the spray head, the length of the hose, the types of materials, that are used in the hoses, that are used in the seals and the gaskets, are is your chemistry or the solvents you're using compatible with the pump systems that customers will be using? Is your coating going to gum up or cure prematurely in the hose if they have a 20-foot hose? 
you know, uh, will your coding perform in those uh, types of systems? So testing your coding, uh, either a two-part system or one-part system, and the actual fluid delivery systems is key as well. And, and then the second bucket for application would be the spray process and equipment. So you have different types of uh, ways to spray material, including HVLP, airless, air-assisted airless, rotary bell, and other electrostatic as well, uh, manual and robotic processes. And what comes into play here is the degree of atomization of your coating, uh, which is gonna dictate the quality of the film formation. So aesthetic quality coatings where that's key, where you need to have a very smooth aesthetically pleasing surface, um, atomization and wetting and film formation all come into play. And that's gonna be dictated by the types of spray equipment, but also how your chemistry interacts with those dynamics being introduced by the spray equipment. So optimizing your formulas to be able to be sprayed with different methods is also important. Um, transfer efficiency really plays into how much waste there is, how much of your material actually reaches the surface and, and stays on the surface and how much is lost to waste. And so this is a critical factor being explored by many different um, uh, manufacturers where they, they want to reduce waste, they want a greener process. You know, the life cycle analysis is, is, is very important right now in terms of how much material is being used and how much is going to waste. In the automotive industry, transfer efficiency is huge. And there, you know, there's a lot of research going into improving transfer efficiencies, you know, above 60, 70 percent uh, to get more of the coating on the actual part itself. And so optimizing your chemistry, the only way you can really test for that is to actually do scale uh, trials on the laboratory uh, from the laboratory going to in a manufacturing environment and actually do the test on a real part. You can't really calculate those um, transfer efficiency values without doing that. Um, curing dynamics. So I already hinted at this, but the mass of your component, whether it's a very large piece of steel, um, is going to have a very high thermal mass, which means that it's going to take a longer period of time to heat up and get to the temperature for curing. Uh, and so one of the things that's not considered is if you have a large thermal mass component and you say your coating itself is cured at, say, 200 degrees C, and they have their oven set at 200 degrees C and they bring this large component in, the, the, the part may not be up at 200 degrees Celsius and you apply and you're trying to cure this coating, the coating doesn't ever see 200 degrees Celsius because of the thermal mass. Now, a, a sheet metal component where you have a very low thermal mass, that, that part will heat up to the 200 degrees Celsius quickly. So being able to understand how sensitive your coating is to you know, the temperature window that's provided by the different types of thermal masses that are gonna be um, used with your coating. Um, and then different types of curing. So you have infrared and you have uh, convection heat and you have ultraviolet and then just ambient cure systems. So understanding how your coating cures with the different types of curing. Um, and there's different subcategories under each of these and different types of equipment with different airflow and different ways of heating. And so um, being, you, normally in the lab, we just test in a little you know, oven and everyone has the same Thermo Fisher oven, but actually getting into a real world uh, manufacturing oven, looking at different types of convection, different types of airflow, whether it's electric or gas heated oven, that makes a difference. Um, and combined with the thermal mass, th that really gives you a good picture of how your coating is going to be uh, cured and how robust the curing process is. So right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring you through some, you know, everything I just said up to this point is very theoretical. So I'm actually going to bring it to real world for you and uh, share some examples we've come across in our work. Um, so I can't share a lot of details with these projects with you because of um, confidentiality agreements, but I, what I'm sharing with you is generic enough to where you get the idea of what, what what's happening, what the problem statement is, and um, gives you enough information 
that I think it can apply to many of us and what we're doing in our in our jobs. So the first example I'll share is the aerospace uh, a customer client that was using a specific coating. They had a one million square foot factory, and coating was part of their process. The entire manufacturing process had to be shut down whenever the relative humidity outside dropped below 30%. And the reason for that was one of the coatings they were using um, under tech data sheet, it stated that this coating uh, you know, should be applied at a relative humidity between 30 and 70%. And because it was an aerospace customer where qualification and quality control is extremely important, they didn't want to risk um, the coating not performing correctly because the, the relative humidity outside was less than 30%. Now, the issue was that the supplier of the material never tested the coating below 30%. So that's why they didn't certify that it would work above 30% because it hadn't been tested, not because it wouldn't work. Nobody knew that. It's just that they wouldn't certify it because it had never been tested. So this is an example where if the raw the formulator had tested their material over a larger operating range of conditions that the their, their customer was going to be experiencing, this customer would, would have been much happier not shutting down 1 million square feet of production every time the humidity dropped below 30%. So then they had to go back and actually do this testing to verify after the fact. Um, another example, this is a composite panel manufacturer. Um, this is where I was discussing earlier about shear force. So this was a, a, a liquid coating and being applied to composite panels on a flat surface and never it worked great in the lab this coating that was being developed worked great in the lab, but once we ran it on a production line, we found out that the coating actually cured in the pump because of the shear forces introduced by the pump. So the pumps, the pneumatic pumps driving the liquid actually instigated uh, the curing reaction. Uh, and this is some, and then gummed up the pumps and it was thousands of dollars of repairs to repair these pumps. Um, and so this is something you don't want your customer to experience the first time they use your material. Um, but we were able to catch it before it actually went to full scale commercialization. Um, another example, a structural component. Um, this was basically after production, premature failures of the material, this structural component was occurring in the field. And the question is why? Why are these parts now failing? It eventually traced back to needing to understand the relationship between the radical swings of humidity and temperature that were being experienced in their manufacturing plant, which was in the um, down in the south, where there's a lot, a lot of uh, variability in humidity and temperature, and the particular uh, chemistry they were using was uh, pretty sensitive to moisture conditions and how it cures. So this was leading to failures in the field. Again, this was because the material had not been tested um, premature, you know, pre before this regarding its curing dynamics with the different environmental conditions. Another example, um, this is a coating manufacturer um, that was making a coating for a container, okay? Uh, that's all I'll say about it. But this container, uh, the, the coating needed to have a very aesthetically pleasing, uh, clear, glossy, no defects, because it was going directly to consumers and it had to look perfect uh, on this container. Uh, but this new chemistry that was being developed for this container uh, worked great, uh, you know, on test coupons in the lab. But once we translated it into pilot manufacturing, the sensitivity of the coating to every single variable was critical to the optical and aesthetic nature of the coating after it cured. 
So things like pinholes and air entrapment and craters and dimples and defects were seen. And these were all being driven by changes in air pressure of the spray gun, of the, the nozzle tip size, uh, the types of solvents that were being used in the coating and the ratio of the different solvents, um, the actual rotation speed of the um, of the container itself while it was being sprayed, how fast it was being rotated. This data was collected and used to actually change the design of the formula so that it was more robust in terms of uh, experiencing changes in these variables that weren't so sensitive, so it wouldn't end up being so sensitive to these variables in the in the factory. Again, something that wouldn't have been seen unless it was um, tested first in the factory. Um, another example uh, is a resin manufacturer that was developing a very green chemistry. What I mean by that is uh, it was low energy input to cure it. So that was their value proposition was um, you know let lower energy footprint um, because of the, the the type of curing chemistry that was involved. But uh, actually quantifying that, like in a life cycle analysis, was um, difficult to do without, and in, in just by looking at it in the lab, because if you actually start to think about the factory and calculating the actual energy savings, you have to understand the type of ovens that are being used. You have to understand the heat, the airflow. You have to understand the heat mass of the component. Like I said earlier, whether it's a large piece of steel or a piece of sheet metal, uh, the, the differences in heat masses change the the amount of um, savings that that the was going to be applied to the end customer in terms of their energy savings. So the only way to actually do this experiment and get the information is to go in pilot scale production and do it on different types of ovens and different geometries of parts to to get a range of values that show the customer how much energy they will save by using this chemistry. Um, all right, so another example. Film manufacturer makes a film, gets a coating applied to the film. All of the development work for the coating was done in the lab initially. And then pilot scale production was done uh, on, on smaller runs and then larger scale. And what became apparent was that the coating was very sensitive to um, the changes in airflow, the rate at which the coating was being heated in the oven the temperature gradient in the oven, uh, the amount of solvents and the types and ratios of the solvents. And again, this was a type of coating that had to be flawless in terms of optical appearance. So there was a lot of iteration back and forth between running the coating on a production line and then re-tweaking the formula and going back to production, tweaking the formula, going back to the production several times before it was perfected. Um, but this is an example where if you got um, if you had done development from the beginning in production sooner rather than later, those changes could have been made sooner in the development process. Another example, this is a um, industrial coating applied in a very corrosive wet environment. And um, so every little nook and cranny of the steel had to be coated. You couldn't be any imperfections and edges because any exposed areas then lead to corrosion and over years and then this leads to failure of the these large structures and so uh, and very expensive repair afterwards so every square millimeter had to be coated with the right dry film thickness and where this became challenging is not on the flat surfaces but it became challenging on the edges the internal edges there's a lot of weld joints and seams external, internal edges, C channels. Uh, and so this is where rheological control of the coating is critical in terms of, and the surface tension of the liquid and how does it pull back from edges? You know, uh, many of you may be familiar with coatings going around edges and how sharp edges can be really difficult to coat, uh, whether they be internal or external edges and then all other types of geometry. So this was critical to the corrosion of um, resistance of the material. So this is where you have to pay a lot of attention to rheological 
properties of the material and surface tension of the material and the quality of the substrate. If it's dirty, sometimes that can affect it as well. The only way to test these things is to actually spray it with real equipment uh, on the real parts. Um, some other examples, the electronics industry. Um, so th in this example, their, this manufacturer, their application process was absolutely fixed. They could not change the way the material was being applied. Um, and so, because it, for a number of reasons, which I can't really disclose, this was the only way they could apply this material. Um, and, and because of that, that um, was back engineered into how the chemistry was designed, is being designed. Uh, so viscosity is huge, rheological dynamics, surface tension, and how, how compatible it is with other materials. So the only way to develop this particular formula is to look at the application process that they're using, and it has to integrate into that process. Uh, another example in the automotive um, industry. So um, you, you think about in the lab where you're doing, you know, a small test coupon and you measure, you know, something like film hardness. So you measure, um, you know, de degree of cure or something like this. And you assume that that's going to be the same when you spray a large format object. It's going to be uniform over the entire surface. But in this particular instance, where the coating was being applied with a rotary bell with a robot uh, over a very large surface that had shape to it, the question that, that they wanted to know was, um, is the cross-linking of the coating the same and uniform over this entire part? So the, the testing that was done was using the actual rotary bell and, and robot that was going to be used in the plant spraying the three-dimensional shape apart, uh, and then doing a two-dimensional grid mapped to the surface and doing chemistry on the entire two-dimensional two grid and, and looking at the degree of cross-linking to show that the uh, cross-linking was uniform over the entire surface. This is, again, something you couldn't learn or do uh, just in a small lab format. Um, another example, waste management. I alluded to this earlier. What happens to the coating that doesn't go to the part? Where does it go? Um, does it get collected? Does it get um, reused? So, and there's certain instances where you can collect coating and reuse it. And there's, there's systems that are in place that can do that. But how much of your coating can be recaptured and reused? And what are the process steps necessary to do that? Manufacturers may want to know that information and they may want to know. What's the transfer efficiency of your material to a, to a part? What's the best way? What's the best application technique, air pressure, type of gun, et cetera, that gives them the best transfer efficiency so they can minimize waste? Manufacturers are very keen to know that right now. Uh, so if you can, you can generate that data, that, that gives you a competitive advantage over someone else. If you can show somebody savings because of transfer efficiency, that gives you a, a huge competitive advantage. Um, and then another example we had was the tech data sheet showed the performance should be X, but when it was applied in the field and samples were taken and um, they measured these properties, um, spray, you know, field applied material, it significantly differed from the tech data sheet. And this was something that was um, repeatable, you know, it was persistent problem. The, the field data was always different than the tech data sheet. So the question is, what's causing the loss in the performance of the material? Is it the chemistry or is it, is it the formulating side? Is it a raw material problem that's different? Or is it actual application process is different and in, introducing different variables that the tech data sheet at the lab scale was developed at the lab scale didn't didn't take into account. So being able to test your material in a real world environment, you can get performance data that would 
uh, be more accurately represented on a tech data sheet um, before it goes to market. So um, to give you some examples of you know the type of equipment uh, that you can use to do um, spray and coating of surfaces, this this type of system is a reciprocal spray system that uses flat substrates and you, you can have a very large flat substrate here moving along this line and these spray guns uh, will reciprocate back and forth in the spray chamber while the part is moving and then it moves into different types of curing chambers. It's called a flat line. Um, various manufacturers make them but this is typical uh, in manufacturing and you can use these to coat wood, plastic, metal, composites, plastics, even textiles if you mount it properly. Um, and so you can do a lot of spray dynamics and transfer efficiency studies in this type of defined system. And you can change out different types of spray guns and different types of pumps and delivery systems that deliver the material to the spray guns from pneumatic to gear pumps. And then look at how does the coating actually perform in terms of how does it move through the lines? Does it gum up the lines? Is it compatible with different seals and gaskets in the pumps? Those are types of things you can you can understand and know as well as understanding how is film formation, uh, what's the best way to get best uh, transfer efficiency, and is there defects in the coating, optical defects like pinholes or craters uh, that are being seen and the spray level that we didn't see in the lab. Um, some other equipment. This is uh, on the right here. You see. Uh, different types of U ultraviolet curing. So um, wide format ultraviolet curing. There's different ways to cure things with UV light. So you have the traditional low pressure arc bulb, you have LED and you have microwave fusion or three different types of UV, for example, and optimizing your chemistry and the photo initiator packages and everything else in the formula so that it can cure with the right type of curing technology because there is big differences and then formulating around that and testing it um, is critical and then you know typical ovens like infrared ultraviolet and convection ovens on a hang line type system where the part is moving from um, oven to oven in a linear sequence this is typical in a, in a plant or a factory this is like a simulated manufacturing line this is what we have set up here at the ChemQuest Technology Institute in South Boston, Virginia. We have the system set up to be able to do this pilot scale testing. Um, so here's the hang, some more photos of the hang lines. You have parts that hang on hooks. This is something you might see in an automotive or any kind of manufacturing plant where parts are hung on hooks and they can be serpentined around the factory for hundreds and hundreds of yards. Uh, as they go through different stages of the process. And so we can simulate that here as the part is moved from the spray chamber, whether it's a liquid spray chamber or powder coating spray chamber, and then advances into different booths to do different types of curing. So here we can test um, three-dimensional components, large three-dimensional components with different convex and um, co concave uh, internal um, you know, geometries. Uh, hard to reach areas and looking at, really look at transfer efficiency, look at the heat mass effect in terms of how does the part handle in the oven once it gets in the oven. Um, and so this, this system really helps with three dimensional parts. Another system we have in place is just a really large spray booth where you're bringing in, um, you'd have a manual spray operation here. So this could be, you know, simulating a factory manually sprayed component, but it also could be simulating how the coating will apply out in the field. If they're spraying a bridge or they're spraying a you know, a building or something, how does the coating uh, apply out in the field? And so we could control the uh, airflow velocity in here. We could control, um, to a certain extent, we can control temperature in this booth. Um, and we can bring in outside air from outside to simulate you know, what's ever happening outside in terms of the air temperature and humidity uh, outside, so more like a field applied approach here. So, but you have a well-defined system 
uh, with you know um, different parameters that you can control and measure for field applied coatings or factory. Um, so I'm going to get into a little bit about pretreatment of substrates. This is critical and something that's normally not tested in the lab scale too much. Usually people test their coatings on cold rolled steel, maybe, um, you know, like the Bondurite panel, panels where they'll look at iron phosphate pretreatment. But other than that, there's not too much really studied at the pretreatment level at the lab level. Um, but there, there are different types of pretreatments that manufacturers use, and it would be a good idea, I think, to understand how does your coating apply over different types of pretreatments, as well as being able to tell the customer, this is the best pretreatment method that works with our coating. So there's mechanical methods, there's chemical methods, there's surface modification methods, um, and then energy treatments like plasma, corona, and flame treatments to try to raise the surface energy. Um, grit blasting, um, baths, chemical baths, um, conversion coatings. There's just a whole range of different ways that coatings are pre uh, substrates are pretreated. That's going to depend on the manufacturer, what they have set up, what they're used to. And so actually showing your client you've tested your coating under a different types of pretreatment methods is, uh, could give you a, a good advantage. Uh, the wetting equation, you know, pretreatment plays into wetting of your coating, and that's going to vary from pretreatment to pretreatment. And critical to the performance of your coating is going to be wettability to the substrate. Um, and wettability is a, a difficult, a very tricky equation. It's got a lot of dynamics to it, but the major issue, components to the um, factors that are used in understanding spreading. Or, this, or wetting is the spreading coefficient. And for, for a coating to wet your part, the surface tension of, um, or the, the surface energy of your surface, the su substrate, has to be greater than the surface tension of the liquid plus the surface energy between the solid and the liquid itself. And if, if that criteria is met, uh, you'll, the, liquid will have the tendency to, to spread across the surface and wet the surface. If the surface energy of the substrate is less than the sum of the surface tension of liquid plus the surface energy of the solid liquid interface, then uh, the liquid will tend to beat up on itself. And if you're at the critical threshold, you, you know, in your lab test, you might say, well, I got great wetting, but if you're really close to this equation being satisfied, when you have any variation in the factory level, you could go quickly go from um, a wetting condition into a non-wetting condition, and now you have large areas or voids that don't have any coating because the, the coating basically um, balled up on itself and left areas exposed where it wasn't completely wetting the surface. And this is not something you may not have seen. You may not have seen unless you explored. A large range of pretreatments and also cleanliness of the substrate. You know, how well can your coating withstand a little dirt or a little oil, a little grease on this that's left behind on the substrate? Or does it have to be perfectly clean and conditions have to be perfect for you to get wetting? So, designing your formula to have a wider range of wettability conditions. Um, and testing that is, is critical. Um, this is just an example of plasma pretreatment, just to give you an example. Uh, with low surface energy materials, uh, the surface energy is low, so you're not really satisfying this wettability equation because the surface energy is too low, but there's a way to actually raise the surface energy of the material by treating it with flame or corona or plasma. Plasma is a good example. What happens is you have highly energetic ions in the plasma state, including electrons. Those electrons have a larger kinetic energy than the bond energy of your of your substrate. The electrons impinge onto the substrate and uh, break the bonds in the substrate. And then those bonds are now uh, are free radicals and they react with the oxygen in the atmosphere and they oxidize. So you end up on the surface is oxygen containing 
you know, carbonyl OH groups, carboxylic acid groups, OH groups um, that now are functional groups that can cross-link with your code, chemistries in your coating. So raising the surface energy of the material can be a great way of, of the substrate can be a great way to uh, improve the um, adhesion or the wettability of your coating to the substrate. So um, I got a little bit more time here. I want to talk about um, environmental effects on the coating itself, meaning temperature and humidity, and how does that play a role in the factory? Now, important to point out that obviously field applied coatings are going to experience a lot of temperature and humidity ramps. But one thing maybe people don't understand is even in the factories, they're going to experience wide fluctuations in temperature and humidity because most factories do not. Um, um, condition their air to be within a defined window. Now, some do, depending on what type of manufacturing is going on, like electronics, maybe automotive, they're going to uh, control uh, humidity and temperature conditions to within a narrow band. But most, you know, 80% of manufacturers don't. And so they're just bringing in outside air. And, you know, the, the conditions in their plant can go from 20% relative humidity in a day up to 80 percent and the temperature can fluctuate uh, as widely as well and so does your coating perform well under large temperature and humidity conditions and this is a quote here from um, a, a large uh, rum a large formulator in the market that everyone would know but uh, this is what they told us they said both decorative and industrial coatings are used and applied under a wide range of environmental conditions. We don't control the conditions under which our customers apply our coatings, whether they are applied in the field or under factory conditions, which are never perfectly controlled either. On the other hand, our customers are looking for consistent performance and experience with our products. So having the ability to test the performance of our products when we are designing them so that we can both understand and design our coatings to have the robust and consistent performance that we want our customers to have is important. We want to avoid our product failing. If we only test at 70 degrees or 35 degrees and one humidity condition, we have no idea what our customers will get under real world conditions. So I'll stop there. But the, the, the general idea is, you know, in the lab, usually testing to an ASTM standard, which, which usually only tells you one temperature and, and maybe a humidity to, to test under, but then it's not tested either you know for long range testing of the coating is one thing after it's cured but how about when it's being applied the application conditions while it's still liquid and moving on to the substrate and curing what are the dynamics there uh when when you have different in humidity and temperature conditions and those do play a large role just to show you across the united states this is the average relative humidity for different areas of the united states and you can see areas out here in Nevada, Arizona that are below 20%, very, very dry conditions. And then other areas where you, uh, down in Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, you have 70 to 80% relative humidity. And then that's just the United States. And you think about globally, you know, the, the range of temperature and humidity conditions that exists across the planet. And if you want your coating to perform everywhere, then this becomes an issue. And again, this will become an issue in a factory because the factory operating in Nevada is going to have very low humidity conditions. And not just, um, you know, in terms of ge uh, geography, but in, a, in one location, one facility throughout the day, you can see the fluctuation in a given day in a 24 hour period. The relative humidity in the AM is normally pretty high, and then it lowers. Uh, to a lower level uh, after afternoon, and then it comes back up in the evenings, and the air temperature fluctuates as well. So understanding where your customers are going to be applying their coatings, what geography they live in, what are the annual conditions for humidity and temperature, and then actually doing tests of your coating in those conditions while it's being applied. This is an example of Sydney, Australia. You know, you can see throughout the different months as well. This is a two-dimensional topographic map looking at a cross-section of different times throughout the day as well as different months throughout the year. You can see how the relative humidity changes 
and what the ranges are of those. So what happens in the substrate in different humidity conditions? Um, so basically, if, you're t if your substrate is below the dew point of the atmosphere, you'll have some type of condensation. Um, now, the, the dew point can actually be quite high because you have relative humidity conditions that are high. So you may have a you know factor you're operating at 80% relative humidity, and even though the temperature is not really that low in the factory, there could be a situation where you, now you're below the dew point and you're getting some type of moisture on the surface of the substrate. And that will affect, um, you know, can cause some flash rusting there uh, that uh, actually start or kickstart the corrosion process. And then also we talked about the free surface energy of the surface and how that plays in the wetting. You know, moisture content can actually affect the surface energy of the, and change the wettability equation and how well a film is going to form. Um, and then after you get the coating onto the substrate, um, how fast is, if you have a water-based coating, if it has any water content in, in it whatsoever, how fast does the water evaporate out of the coating? Because that's going to determine um, how well the film cures. If it's too fast, if it's too slow, you can run into issues. You can have loss of adhesion, and then it was as well as loss of uh, chemical resistance and corrosion resistance because of this. So um, understanding how your coating applies uh, in different humidity conditions onto different substrates is, is important. Now, that's the substrate. Now, what about application of the actual coating itself using the spray device? So if you actually zoom in and look at a single droplet, you know, the atomization and the size of these droplets that's going to dictate the film formation, how um, aesthetically pleasing the coating is. If you want a really high glass gloss smooth finish, then this is atomization in, in the actual droplets and their size and their velocity is, is critical. And there's actually devices you can purchase that you know, has a laser that scans these um, droplets and tells you the histi histogram of droplet size and um, velocity so you can maximize film quality. And this is really important, obviously, in automotive uh, conditions, but uh, the, the principles apply everywhere. And in these droplets, um, as they're flying through the air, if it's a water-based droplet, if it has water in it, well, if the relative humidity in the air is low, then the water immediately evaporates out of the droplet. And there's conditions where your droplet can hit the substrate and there's no more liquid left and now you don't have film formation you have basically dry spray and so there's that's a big issue out in low humidity environments uh, where you're spraying or rolling a coating on and it's actually drying faster than the film can form um, and so uh, there's a lot of variables here that need to be taken into account with environmental conditions with spray quality from the air temperature to the humidity and then also the surface tension of your droplets, the rheology of the droplets, um, as well as what's in the droplet itself. Um, so there's a lot of science that goes around this, and there's you know academics that do research papers on this, but just having a general understanding, despite getting some empirical data by going in an actual factory and spraying your coating using different environmental conditions can tell you a lot. And we all know that the viscosity of a liquid is highly dependent on temperature. And we know the surface tension as well is dependent on temperature. So, and these two variables, viscosity and temperature, uh, surface tension, play into uh, the drop dynamics and how the film forms. So, uh, humidity and temperature play a huge role in how your coating is going to look when it, it's finally cured on the customer's part. Um, so, you have uh, different curing dynamics here with the environment. So just to give you an example, here's a latex coating I'm showing here where you have individual latex particles and then the water evaporates out of the coating uh, and the latex particles coalesce and form a film. Well, if, if the humidity is high, this process will be very slow and you really never get curing in a reasonable amount of time. If the humidity is really low, then then this water will evaporate too fast and coalescence won't occur. So that's just 
a really simple example. But then you won't move into things like moisture cure systems, like uh, polyurethanes or silicones or ac cyano or acrylates, where the moisture is critical to the curing reaction. It's critical to understand how does the curing occur in different environmental conditions. Um, and you can get rapid skinning where the interior doesn't cure. Uh, you can get in partial, you can get in, in, insufficient cure. Uh, and so uh, really uh, optimizing your formula in different environmental conditions to cure uh, is critical. 2K systems, um, like for, just to give you an example, a 2K epoxy system with amines as the part B. Uh, the amines are prone to um, blushing, which is a reaction that occurs between the moisture in the air and the carbon dioxide in the air reacts with the amine, forms a carbonate salt, and then the carbonate salt gives you uh, blushing, which is a white crystalline-like or oily-like um, surface uh, of the coating, and it makes it very difficult to put a second coating on top. You lose adhesion, but you also lose aesthetic, obviously, but you also lose, lose film performance, because if the amine is reacting with moisture in the air, then it's not reacting with the epoxy, and so you get reduced film performance. So uh, that's a huge issue in the industry, and it's a competitive advantage to show that you have a formula that doesn't blush. So when you look at you know different Doug, environmental conditions, hey, yes. Hey Doug, it's, it's Marcus. Let me just interrupt a second. We're close to the top of the hour, everyone. If you need to log off, we certainly understand. But we're going to keep moving through Doug's presentation. The slides will be distributed later this afternoon, and the recording, as always, will be available on paint.org in the next day or so. Um, so if you have to hop off, we'll see you on the next webinar. But if you want to hang on, we're going to keep on um, just moving on through the presentation. Thanks, Doug. Okay, now let's just have a couple more slides. Um, so, you know, looking at the range of temperature and humidities, I would recommend testing your coating, like applying your coating not after it's cured and then putting in a humidity chamber I'm talking about actually applying the coating onto the substrate in these different conditions i would use low temperature low humidity you can see this is the psychometric chart here and this shows you the temperature humidity if you hit different areas of the extremes of the chart the four corners and then the one in the center that would be like the bare minimum i would do um, five different points there for application performance to show, uh, you know, robustness in, in the wildest extremes of uh, environmental conditions. We actually designed the chamber. There was nothing out on the market that did this. Um, so we designed one for our own internal use, but we use it for projects with our clients as well, where we designed a application chamber. You can spray coatings using different types of spray apparatus. Um, in a defined humidity temperature chamber. So we can control temperature in one degree in increments and humidity in 1% increments from 10% relative humidity up to 95. And we can change temperature from five degrees Celsius to 65 Celsius and anywhere in between on the entire psychometric map and spray the uh, coating in those environments, let them cure and then test them. This just gives you an example of uh, some data generated in that system. You can see like a moisture cure urethane. You can see how sensitive it is to the different environmental conditions um, in terms of its strength, ultimate strength that was built up in terms of adhesion uh, and how an acrylic, a 2K acrylic, was um, also somewhat sensitive to environmental conditions, but not as sensitive as the moisture cure urethane. Um, but again, this just proves the fact that as you're applying the material, the environmental conditions are going to change the performance. So I'm going to give my summary slide now. Uh, so hopefully you've seen that there is some benefit to actually, maybe your eyes were opened a little bit in terms of things you haven't considered before, some real world problems of uh, what happens when you take your your coating it was designed in the lab and then move it into someone's factory all kinds of issues can arise that you couldn't foresee unpredictable so you know getting ahead of the curve and actually doing some testing in a real world 
manufacturing environment can help address those issues before your customers do. And it can also help you optimize your formula, uh, maybe also optimize raw materials going, if you're a raw materials supplier designing new resins or ligamers or additives to formulas, actually putting it in a real formula and then using uh, application equipment to understand how can you improve your raw materials so that you can go to your formulators and say, hey, our, our additive actually helps um, increase the window of humidity conditions you can apply your coating at, or our additive helps with transfer efficiency, um, et cetera, and makes your coating more robust and durable and, and can withstand different conditions at the factory level. Um, going into the factory, uh, that's a good way of putting it here is that, you know, it answers questions you didn't know to ask. You don't know what you don't know. And once you get in the factory, you know, almost always we've seen there's always a question that wasn't asked at the beginning because it wasn't foreseen and it just exposes things that no one ever predicted. Um, and it provides uh, knowledge beyond what is going to be shown on the tech data sheet um, to your customers. So if you could show your customers, this was actually applied on a real part, on a real line using this type of spray equipment um that's a that'll give you a huge competitive competitive advantage in the marketplace because that's normally not done and that's it that i'll end there and I'll, I'll take questions so i'm going to now go to well here's our con here's our contact information if you want to gain get any information you have questions i'm glad to help um let's see here all right um, thanks, Doug. Um, appreciate that. We don't have any questions in the questions dialog box right now, okay. but while we wait for some to come in, um, I'll go ahead and tell you about a couple of upcoming webinars that we have on May 11th, 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time. This is What You Should Know About Tosca in 2022. This will be presented by Martha Marapiece, who is a partner over at Wiley Ryan LLP. And on May the 23rd, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, we have Making Zero VOC Claims a Legal Perspective. This will be pre presented by Philip Moffitt and Irene Hantman of Verdant Law. And I think we do have something in the questions dialog box here now. Let's see what we have. Oh, that was just a comment for you. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> um, so while we wait to see if anything else pops in there, uh, again, this recording will be available on paint.org in the member center, and it'll be probably there, probably there no later than the end of the day tomorrow. Um, I'll distribute a PDF of the slides this afternoon, so you'll have that. And you can always log on to paint.org, go to the member center, and register for these webinars as they become available. And um, Heidi, if you're still on the line, I don't know if you had anything or if we could uh, go ahead and wrap up. I don't have any questions, but Doug, thank you so much for your time today. I thought it was very interesting. Um, I've never seen much of that equipment, so um, that was a good education for me as well. Thank you. It was enjoyable. Thank you for having me. All right. Yep. Thanks, Doug. And um, thanks to all our members. And um, with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up and hope to see you on a future uh, webinar. Thank all you. Right. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.